Well, the ACI is very proud to present their first guest artist for the evening. At great, great expense, please welcome onto the stage, Mr. Stanley Ross. Thank you for that colossal introduction. Uh, I'm very glad to be here tonight. At my age, I'm glad to be anywhere. Uh, uh, I believe this hall holds 90, 90 people, and it sleeps 65. Is that right? Well, but anyway, uh, I uh, people ask me, you know, is, is he still at it? Is he still at it? And people ask me, when did you start? Well, it's a long story, but I, I think I got my first trumpet when I was either 28 or 29 years old. And I've been playing roughly 50 years. And when I say roughly, <laughs> I mean roughly. But I mean, let's face it, we get away with an awful lot because you know, the average audience doesn't know a G minor from an F flat, you know, or, or any musical terms. For instance, a fugue. Do you know what a fugue is? If you go down to the woods today. <laughs> and what do you get? What do you get when you drop a piano down a mine shaft? A flat minor. <laughs> Uh, this is the AACI, which is Americans. Uh, many Americans here tonight, yes? Yeah. Because, you know, I must tell you, I hope you can understand my accent and some of my Scottish humour. No. <laughs> Somebody mentioned my name in vain. <laughs> of course, this is, uh, this is not really my tartan, you know that? I'm a, a Goldberg tartan. <laughs> <coughs> yes, Americans, yes. So I hope you can understand my Scottish accent. There are one or two American phrases which I don't understand at all. I mean, for instance, this business about a rain check. What's the weather got to do with choosing between coffee or tea, or tea or coffee or whatever? And that's another thing. I saw this coffee togo. And Togo to me is an island in the Pacific. I didn't know what Togo was. And then somebody, it means takeout. You see, in Scotland it would be a carry out. Right? It'd be a carry out, my fun. So, <laughs> and this brings me to a little story I want to tell you about a, a man who was in business and he was sent to America. For, he'd never been in America before. And he had to go to New York on business. And I'm going to sit down if you don't mind because. My legs get tired. I don't get tired. My legs get tired. And I'm very attached to them. You know? <laughs> so, uh, what was I saying? Ah, uh, yes. Um, he'd never been to America before, and he got his tickets. Now, when he got to the airport, he was so excited. Got to the airport about three hours too too soon, too early. So he's walking around the airport, enjoying the atmosphere there. You know, it's thrilling the anticipation. And he sees this old lady <coughs> sitting there. She's crying. So being a decent sort of chap, he goes over to her and asks, what's the trouble, maybe he can help. And she tells him that she's worried about her son. Her son went to America seven years ago. She hasn't heard anything from him. And so she sits in the airport hoping he'll come back. So the man says to him, but you know, you're sitting here, he could be maybe phoning you and you're not at home. No, she said, I, I, I must sit here. She said, I'm very determined to sit here, to see him coming back in. So the man says to him, where is he? He said, he's in New York, but I don't know where he works. So the man says, well, what's his name? She says, his name's John Dunn, D-U-N-N. But don't you know where he works? She says, somebody said something about Madison Avenue, but I really don't know. So the fellow feels sorry, he says, gives her a packet of Kleenex, says, you go home, dry your eyes, your son will get in touch with you one of these, don't worry about it. He goes away, gets on the plane, forgets all about this old lady. He gets to New York, and he's in this taxi cab, you see, and he's driving all New York, and he says to the cabbie, where are we now? 
And the cabbie says, we're in Madison Avenue, buddy. Oh, he says, Madison Avenue. All of a sudden he thinks of this old lady. And he said, Madison Avenue. And while he's thinking about it, he sees a big sign up there. It says, Dunn and Bradstreet. <laughs> so he says, yeah, this might not be so difficult. He says to the cabbie, stop here and I'll go into this building. So he goes into the building. Uh, he asks the guy at the door, where is the offices of Dunn and Bradstreet? He says, 65th floor, buddy. He says, 65th floor? He'd never seen you. So what? He goes in the elevator and he comes out on 65th floor, the most beautiful reception area, deep plush carpets, flowers, lights, even a little fountain, most beautiful reception area you've ever seen. Offices, welcome to offices of Dunn and Bradstreet. And he goes in and there's three receptionists there, they're all busy. So he waits till one's not so busy. And he goes over to this one and he says, excuse me, she says, he says to her, do you have a John here? She says, yes, down the corridor, the last door on the left. <laughs> so he goes down and there's a man there just drying his hands and he says to him, phone your mother. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anyway, you all have a good time tonight. And we'll all soon put a stop to that. <laughs> anyway, uh, yes, uh, you know, last month I did a concert, one of my last concerts. <laughs> I've just started a new series of last concerts. And that, <clears throat> they're very popular, you know, it's amazing. And I must tell you that well, I, I see we have quite a few Irish people here tonight. I'm very happy to have them here. We had a very nice crowd of Irish uh, people at my concert. And I want to tell you one thing. There's a wonderful thing about the Irish. is They don't mind if you tell jokes about uh, Irish jokes. In fact, they laugh harder than we do at them, you know. And um, I would just wanted to tell you about uh, uh, one that I told there. And if anybody's heard it before, uh, about the police in Dublin. And they raided a house which was being used by a gang of art forgers. They were copying old masters, you see, and trying to sell them as originals. And the police confiscated 16 paintings, all signed by Pasacco. <laughs> <laughs> and then I heard of this Irish fellow, he came in Ali Yar. He was, he was greatly enamored with this uh, Israeli custom of what the Israelis call the al Haish. You know, the barbecue business, you know, barbecues. So he decided he wanted to do the same thing. So he went down to get all the equipment and stuff, and bricks, one thing and that. So the man said to him, how many bricks do you need? He said, I need 58 bricks. He said, what, 58 bricks? What's 58 bricks? He said, well, I live on the seventh floor. He said, anyway, think, forget about that one, was it? But, <laughs> there's, um, as you know, Ireland is a, is a Roman Catholic country. And uh, I heard a story about this um, young Jewish lad. He, he couldn't get a job. He got a job as a janitor in a Roman Catholic convent. Now, I don't know if they have janitors. It doesn't matter. <laughs> he got a job there as a janitor. And after a week, the, um, after the week, they get called into the office. And he was said, you know, you started the work, your work is all right, but there's two or three things that you're doing which are not quite right, and we, we must put you right on it. She says, for one thing, she said, when you, when you, when you wash, you mustn't wash your hands in the holy water. <laughs> says, there's a sink in the kitchen for that. And she says, the other thing, when you come in in the morning, we don't like you hanging your hat and coat on the cross. <laughs> and she says, my name is Mother Superior, and not Mother Shapiro. <laughs> well, you know, Murphy had bought a pub, and uh, Flanagan went along to see him. The pub had, he'd only had this pub a few weeks, and he went along to see him, and he said, how's business in the pub? Oh, he says, it's terrible. He says, I bought a white elephant. It's absolutely terrible. So Flanagan says, but he says, you only just started, give it a chance, maybe things will improve. So he said, okay, well, we'll give it a wee try. So he went back to him a few weeks later and he goes in. Again, there was, there was only two people in the whole pub. And his pal said to him, no, he says, it's no good. He said, you know, nobody's coming in here. Nobody's coming in here. He said, they're all going now to this lounge bar. You know, he said, it's hopeless. So he said, pal says to him, what are you going to do? He said, I've decided what I'm doing. He says, I'm going to shut down the pub 
and a moment in a brothel. So, shocked faces. So his pal says to him, are you crazy? Opening a brothel. He says, if you couldn't sell the beer, you'll never sell the soup. 